Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium, where we're going to talk about five data science myths. The idea here is to break down what the community is saying about data science and machine learning and create a moat that separates fact from fiction. If you do like the video, please do drop a like on this kind of content if you do love it. And also, we have a Discord server now that we want you to be a part of. It's down in the description below, so please do check it out and join our community since we're talking about some amazing things there. And with that, let's get started with the video. Data scientists only work in large organizations. This is a myth. There's actually a few things that data scientists do and can be useful for in a smaller organization setting, and we'll go through three of them right now. The first one is testing. So let's say that I work in an e-commerce company and I've designed this new search algorithm that's going to be powering the search bar on my site. Now, before rolling this out to like, let's say I'm a small company, so thousands of users, I want to make sure that I test this out just to make sure that it doesn't affect the KPIs, the key performance indicators that I care about. And these KPIs can be click-through rates or purchase conversions. I just wanna make sure that I'm not cannibalizing any of that because if I were to release a new product that negatively affects these KPIs, what's the point? And testing can help you identify that. A second major task that data scientists can do in small organizations is analysis. Analysis is great because it can help you identify potential changes that you would make and also the opportunity and money that it can bring to the company, potentially. So let's take an example here. I am now running a company which has multiple warehouses located across the country. And maybe there are certain products that I want to send to certain warehouses because it's a lot cheaper to process. At the moment, we're sending products to random warehouses, but if we had send, let's say, I don't know, certain products to certain warehouses, how much money could we have saved? And this is something that you can determine with a retro analysis using historical data. And this is where data analysis really does shine. And it can help influence any further decisions that you or other stakeholders who are working on this project can make. A third thing that data scientists can actually do and have value in in small organizations is building platform tools. So there's a lot of tools that need to be used by everybody who is interacting with data within your organization. Some of these tools could be, for example, business intelligence tools, which can be used to query data, such as Tableau or Superset. Some of these are tools like a data warehouse where all of your data resides like Amazon Redshift or Snowflake. Or you could be setting up pipelines to process stream data. And this could be done with like Amazon's Kinesis or anything else. And so building out these tools for a small organization is actually a lot better because you have room and time to just grow and scale with the company as it does rather than just start with a big corporation. In fact, it could also be difficult to become a big corporation these days without leveraging that data. More data guarantees us to build a model. This is also a myth. And when making decisions about determining whether you should be using a machine learning model or not, there are two major factors to consider. So the first is your data quantity. Do you have enough data to accurately build a good machine learning model? So what this means is typically machine learning involves identifying patterns between inputs and outputs. If your model does not have enough data to identify these patterns between the inputs and outputs, then you cannot use machine learning. But let's say that you do have enough data that goes back years in time. But another factor you now need to consider is data quality. This means that how noisy is the patterns in your data? Because if the matching patterns between inputs and outputs are so noisy that your model cannot pick it up, no matter how much data you have, you can't build a model out of it anyways. So when trying to decide whether to use a machine learning model or not, do consider data quantity as well as data quality. 
Models that are more accurate are always better. This is also a myth. And there are three main factors that you kind of need to worry about when building machine learning models. The first is model interpretation. When your model gives an output, can you say why your model gave that output? So these days, we could use something called Shapley values in order to easily determine this. I've explained this in another adjoining video, so if you want some more information on Shapley values, do check that out. But model interpretation also becomes important during the feature selection phase when you're trying to identify what features would be important to actually include in your model. And this you can do with more simplistic linear models, let's say like a logistic or linear regression. And you can do this with something called stats models in Python. Another factor that you want to be worrying about is simplicity. Let's say that there are two approaches that can solve the same problem. Approach one uses a very simple model or a SQL query that gets you 90% accuracy. And approach two uses say a complex neural network which gets you a 92% accuracy. Which would you choose? Well, by the principle of Occam's razor, we would choose the first one, which is a lot simpler. And despite having a slightly less accuracy, it saves a lot of time in building the product and also maintaining it in the future. And in the event that we really do need to scale up, we have an option to do so when we require it. A third factor that data scientists should be concerned with is how a model is being used and also whether the model is being used at all. You can have the most performant model, state of the art results, but if the person that you design the model for does not use it, then what's the point? In order to make sure that situations like this don't happen, you need to be in constant communication with your stakeholders and also vocalize what your model can do and cannot do so that they get a complete picture. They know exactly how, when, and why they're using the model. I know communication in general is very hard to practice, but I do think that if you are able to teach certain concepts and practice teaching certain complicated concepts, it becomes easier for you to communicate. And I've discussed this approach of teaching in detail in one of my past videos, so do check that out if you're interested. AI will take your job and everyone else's. This is also a pretty big myth. Now, a lot of this myth kind of stems from the frenzy around artificial general intelligence. So with current machine learning processes, we have a model that initially knows absolutely nothing and we train it on a specific task and eventually that model is able to perform that specific task. But it's really not intelligent enough to do anything more beyond that one task that you consistently train this model on. It cannot you cannot train a model that knows chess to automatically be a pro at Go or checkers, even though there are some similarities between the games. Now, there's been a lot of research in the community about taking this intelligence into another tier. And this is instead of task level intelligence, what if we have general task intelligence? So a model is able to generalize across multiple tasks. And this is the goal of artificial general intelligence. But even at this stage, it's not like all jobs are just gonna go away. Like for example, let's take the example of a doctor where doctors who are performing surgeries, every data point there is a life. So even if you are to come up with a system that has a 98 or 97% chance of success, you have to be careful of that 2% because 2% is a human life. They are not just numbers or statistics. That said, AI can be used as a supportive instrument to doctors or in identifying certain anomalies in an x-ray, but it cannot be used potentially to like perform a full-blown surgery. Once a model is trained and deployed, it is done for good. Also a big myth because a lot of the work that comes associated with the modeling is maintenance. Let's talk about three major tasks that you need to look out for. The first is deploy failures. So now you have your model and now you deploy your model to the production environment. And then you will see, well, the deploy either succeeds or it fails. 
If it fails, you kind of want to continuously monitor the logs just to make sure that you identify what the source of the issue is. And even on successful deployment, another aspect that you need to look at is identifying 500s. So 500s could be internal server errors that could be the result of probably somebody calling your service in a way that you didn't anticipate them to call it, or just handling certain edge cases and logical flaws that you probably didn't catch on the first time around. A third thing you need to look out for is load handling. So right now you are in a small organization, let's say, and your product or your service is not being hit by very many people. But then over time, you'll have a large number of users that hit your product. A large number of requests need to be serviced by this product. And so you have to make sure that your service is able to handle that load. This could involve scaling up memory because you might have memory issues, moving to a larger CPU instance, or even refactoring your code potentially in some cases if it's too slow to run. And so clearly monitoring and maintenance is a huge part of the data science pipeline that is generally overlooked because I can see how one would think that, oh, once we deploy, we're done. But clearly that is not the case. That is all I have for this video. I hope you identified these myths today. If you didn't know before, now you know. If you knew before, well, great. I just hope you were entertained. And please do drop a like on your way out if you do like the video. Also, do join us on Discord because we're talking about some amazing things there. And I'm going to upload another video super soon. You're going to see some amazing content. And I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.